scripture verses for today is found in uh, Luke, the 13th chapter, and uh, we're going to go through 31 through 34. And the caption of the scripture verses today says, Jesus' sorrow for Jerusalem. And actually, I don't know if you remember it or not, but Jesus had quite a bit sorrow for Jerusalem. I don't know if you remember, he was on his way to Jerusalem and he started crying over Jerusalem. Jesus actually only cried three times that I know of in the Bible, mentioned in the Bible. And uh, one of those times when, when he looked down upon Jerusalem and basically recognizes the state of the, the affairs that they were in, the condition that they were in as Jerusalem. But the scripture verses for today says, at that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else because Herod wants to kill you. You know, we often think of Pharisees as being all bad. Now, there were a lot of them. Most of them were against Jesus for sure, but there were some who cared about him. And it, it, obviously, this text shows us that, that they were concerned for his life. Some of the Pharisees were concerned for his life. And Jesus replied, Go tell that fox, talking about Herod, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. And then he said this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. I heard a story one time about a little girl, a small child. She wasn't even old enough to be in school, and, and she went into one of those uh, mirrored mazes, you know, at the carnivals and the fairs and all of that, those little mirror mazes that you go into uh, in an amusement park. And her father had, you know, obviously he wasn't going to let her go in there all by herself, but somehow she got away from him and slipped away from him. But when he saw, he saw her trying to find her way out, and she began to cry. She was getting upset because she's, she's in this maze, and she's not really sure how to get out, and she's wondering how, you know, what's going to happen. She began increasingly, she become increasingly confused, it said, by all the paths that she could take until she heard her father's voice. And her father was outside. He sees her in there, and he sees what's going on, and he, and he says something to her. He says, don't cry, honey. Please don't cry. Just put your hands out and reach out, and you will find the door. Just follow my voice. While as he spoke, the little girl became to calm, calm down, and she soon did exactly what he told her to do, and eventually she found the door to get out, and she went to her father's outreached arms. You know, God is calling all of us. He has called us. He always will call us. He is calling all of us, uh, all of us from the confusion of the maze of life, I call it. I'm guessing you know what I'm talking about when I said the confusion of the maze of life. I mean, we can go all different ways. This life will take us all different roads, all different paths to go to. And all of those paths don't lead the right way. But God is calling us, each and every one of us, to help us to get through those times and help us to know the way to go. Actually, Jesus said it himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Basically, he is saying this, just like the Father said in the story today, just follow my voice. You say, well, I would follow God's voice if I could just hear God speak. Well, actually, God does speak to us. He speaks to us in many different ways. I personally think that he speaks to us mostly through his word. More than any other way, if you want to know the way and the directions to go in life, I, I don't know about you, but I know this. When I'm trying to find out how I'm going to go or what I'm going to do, I always pick that book up. I always do. That book is full of wisdom, full of guidance, full of inspiration, full of hope, full of peace, full of joy, full of, full of everything that I need. That book gives me those things and gives me the direction that I need. So God speaks mostly through his word as far as I'm concerned, but he also calls us and speaks to us through Jesus. Jesus is the, basically the skin and bones of God. You want to know what God's like? Well, just look what Jesus was like. Jesus was God, actually, the Bible says. God yearns for us. He really does. And as I talk to you today, I want you to just see how much God really yearns for us. 
He really truly does. He yearns for the time also, the time when we will actually all kind of be with him again. And he yearns for the time when the relationship between him and his creation will also be perfect as it once was. I don't, of course, we have never seen that perfect situation, but we know that it was available back in the Garden of Eden. It was perfect. I mean, I, I personally think of the fact that there was, there, obviously there was no COVID back in the Garden of Eden. There probably wasn't no mosquitoes, no flies, no thorns, no thistles, you know. It was a perfect place. I mean, it, it was beyond anything that we really could imagine. But, of course, we know what sin did to that place. We know what it's done to this world that we live in today. But at one time, the Garden of Eden was a paradise. And God yearns for the time when we all will be right with him and his creation. Jesus said, and he was so sorrowful for Jerusalem in our gospel lesson when he says this, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you. Why did God send those people to him? Well, here's why he sent them, as well as Jesus. Why he sent them was to get them back to a relationship with him. And Jesus is basically expressing in our gospel lesson today that yearning that God has for you and for me, that yearning to have a relationship with us. I mean, can you imagine the ache that God feels? As we live our lives and, and apart from him or away from him or in this world that we live in with the thorns and the thistles and all of the directions that we can go and all the wrong directions that we can go in, can you imagine the ache and the hurt in God's heart as he yearns for what he made to be that way again and the relationships that he wants to have with people and how they have been affected by sin your relationship and mine how it has been affected by sin and Jesus says further in verse 34 but they were not willing but they were not willing what Jesus is saying here is that God has tried to bring creation back to him he really has. I mean, all throughout the Bible, especially throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's all mostly about Christ trying to do it back, bring it back into a relationship. But in the Old Testament, I mean, you see over and over and over again where he tried to bring creation and people back to him. In fact, you know, God has tried to bring the fallen creation back to him from Noah to, Je to Jesus. If you remember when Noah, of course, he started over. You know, he, he saw that all was bad. He saw that it wasn't going to work. He saw that sin was so prevalent that he said, you know what? I'm just going to start all over. I'm just going to start all over. Of course, we know he's not going to do that again because he promised that he wouldn't. But all throughout the Bible, God has tried in all kinds of ways to make the relationship between him and his people right. If you recall, God tried through Noah, like I said, and through the flood. And I had, I had said something about Noah some time ago, a few months ago. And see if you remember anything about that. But anyway, do you remember how long it took Noah to build the ark? About 100 years. About 100 years. Now, in fairness to Noah, and I, you know, I'm a builder, and I don't like, you know, I tend to want to get things done, and, and I like to build, and I like to try to build things pretty quickly. In fairness to Noah, he was 600 years old when he started, okay? <laughs> So at 600 years old, I'm not going to be building houses very fast either. I am sure of that. So anyway, it took him about 100 years to build it. He's 600 years old. But do you know what else Noah did? Do you know what he did when people would come up, walk up there and say, Noah, what you building? I'm building an ark. Oh, really? Why are you building an ark? Because there's going to be a flood. Well, what's a flood? A flood is where God is going to destroy this world. So you need to get in a right relationship with God. Hundred years he preached and taught and talked about the fact that you need to get in a relationship with God. God was trying to woo people in. But how many people jumped in that, in that uh, boat that day? None. Other than Noah's family, nobody else came. Nobody else listened. Just as, just as Jesus said, but you were not willing they were living their own way, doing their own thing. They were not paying attention to anything that Noah had to say. But I'll guarantee you this, when the water started coming and it started flooding the world, I bet you they were knocking on that door then. But it's too late. It's too late. So he did it through Noah. He did it through Moses. I mean, we think about Moses and certainly the Ten Commandments. God is trying to give people a direction, trying to say, here is how we have a relationship. First of all, you need, to, you need to seek me first. 
That's how. You will have no other gods before me. Because all of those other gods take away from the relationship that I have with you if you put them before me. He did it through, he did it through Noah. He did it through Moses. He did it through the prophets. I think of Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, 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 Zechariah, Malachi, Jonah, Ezra. Major prophets, minor prophets. All throughout those years of times during the prophets, he said, you've got to have a relationship with God. Each one of them, you've got to have a relationship with God. And they tried to draw people back into that relationship with God. The judges. Judges were basically just leaders. They, they were, in, in the Old Testament times, they were from Joshua to Samuel. Joshua to Samuel. And again, they too, they were good, strong, most of them, good, strong Christian leaders and said, you got to have a relationship with God. God is wooing you back. He's talking through me. He's saying, I want to love you. I want to be with you. I want to help you. On and on and on and on. Yes, God has tried in all different ways, in all different ways to make the relationship between him and his people right. And God has tried to woo. He has tried to win back. He has tried to persuade his people to come back to him. All throughout the Bible and the history of the Old Testament, God worked with the people of Israel trying to draw people back into the relationship with him. But it was to no avail. It was to no avail. The Bible says in verse 34, Jesus said it himself, but they were not willing. And so what does God do? Well, you know, I don't know if he ever thought about destroying the world again. And he thought, well, no, I can't do that. I've already promised that I won't. And God surely isn't going to break a promise to us, so, so I can't do that. Well, what do I do? How do I get them in a how do I How do I get them to come back to me? How do I have a relationship with them? And here's what God decides. God decides that he will send his only begotten son to reconcile the world. That's what he will do, to bring humankind back to him. You see, what humankind would not do for itself, they would not do it. It wasn't that they couldn't do it. It's that they would not do it for themselves. God did for them, and not just for them, but for us as well. That is the great news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, isn't it? It really is. God decided that man could not... When, that he could not win back people and, and man. And so God decided that through Jesus that he would give them the free gift. It was a free gift of salvation. They didn't have, he already saw they wouldn't do it or couldn't do it. So you know what? I'm going to make this really easy for you. I'm going to make it really, really easy for you. All you got to do is receive the free gift. And God decided that man would surely accept a free gift. I mean, most everybody will accept a free gift, right? The gift that they didn't have to work for, the gift that they only had to accept by faith. God's heart longed for his people. His heart longed for his people so much so, he longed for them to trust him, to believe in him, but they would not. So God decided he would take care of it on his own. He decided instead of them coming to him, he would come to them. And he would walk with his people and he would talk with his people and, and he would tell them, you know, as one of them, of, of, of the great love that he had for them. And he would show them through himself of the great love that he had for them. And he walked with them and he talked with them and, and you know, maybe if I show them how much I love them, then maybe they will listen to me. Maybe they will want to have a relationship with me. So God became flesh and he lived among us. I mean, he walked with them and he talked with them and he hurt with them. We talked about that last week. He had feelings. He had emotions. He, he had hurts and pains just like we did. And he taught them, and he pleaded with them. God is like the ruler in the following story. A long time ago, there was a ruler, a king in Persia, and, and he was a good king. He was a great king. He was a wise and good and strong man. And he loved his people. He really loved his people enough so that he wanted to know how they were doing and how they were living. And he wanted to know not just about the good things about them, but their hardships. How's things going for you? And so oftentimes what this king would do at nighttime, he would dress as a beggar and he would leave his castle and go to the homes of the poor people. 
so that he could see just exactly how they, how they lived. Nobody knew that he was a ruler, of course. One time he visits this, visits this really old man and, and uh, he lived in a cellar. He lived in a damp, dreary, old cellar. And so the king, who looked like a beggar at this time, went in, talked to the man, was hanging out with the man, ended up eating the food that he was serving, which probably to a king ain't all that great. And so he spoke cheerful and kind words to this poor old man. But then like that, he was gone. However, he visited the poor man again, and this time he did it a little bit differently. He disclosed to the old man just exactly who he was. He says, I am your king. I am your king. And so the king, of course, he believed that, well, now that I have shared with him exactly who I am, I am certain that he is going to want some kind of gift or some kind of favor from me because that's what everybody does with a king when they have his attention. But the old man didn't. He didn't do that. Instead, he said this, you left your palace and your glory to visit me in this dark, dreary old place. And you ate the coarse food that I ate, and you brought gladness to my heart. To the others you have given your riches, but to me you have given yourself. You know what? This is the way that Jesus came to us. This is the way that Jesus came to us. He came disguised as a lowly man. In fact, so lowly, he was born in a stinky old so a barn, a stall. You talk about going from, going from this to that. I mean, that's where he came from. He came dis disguised as a lowly man, but he brought with us so much. In fact, he brought with us every single need that we might have. He brought with us and gave to us. Without a doubt, there is truly a wonderment about God. When you really read the book, when you really read this book, you will see that there is just such a wonderment about God. He did what he did all he could do to bring the relationship between himself and his people in the right order. Whether it was the Old Testament or the New Testament, he did everything that he could do. Especially in the New Testament, he comes to earth, he walks with his people, he talks with his people, he dies for his people. He is raised from the dead for his people. What, it ain't enough to die. You've got to be raised in order you know, for the power. He is raised from the dead for his people, and he gives them the free gift of salvation. And then he gives them the free choice to take it or leave it. That, to me, that's amazing in itself. I don't know about you, but if I worked that hard, if I gave all that I had to give to you or to somebody else and, and, and then you give them the free choice, I mean, it kind of, I, I use the example today of cooking Thanksgiving meal. You know, lots of, lots of you remember cooking Thanksgiving meals and, you know, you might spend, you know, you start like the day before. Or actually, you shop probably two days before and then, you, and then you start cooking the meal and you spend, you know, 10, 12 hours cooking this meal. How would you feel if everybody came and said, oh, I'm not hungry? I just thought, you know, I stopped at McDonald's. I got a cheeseburger at McDonald's before I got here. I'm really not hungry. How would you feel? Here's how I'd feel. You're eating this food. <laughs> I don't care what you've had before. You're eating this food. What do you mean you don't want it? Can you imagine how God feels when we say, what do you mean we don't want it? What do we mean we don't want it? You know, God, he places the gift of salvation in our hearts. And then he says, you can believe in the promises. You can believe in the promises that I have made to you. Or you can choose not to. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. You know, God, Jesus died for all. He died for all. And actually, the Bible says in 1 Peter, Jesus, the Bible says in 1 Peter, God said that he doesn't want anyone to perish without having a relationship with him. Uh, you know, Sherry and I were reading a scripture verse a couple, couple days ago, and we were talking about, uh, actually it was Romans where it said that, that God predestined those to be saved. Well, he predestined all to be saved. It's just everybody doesn't choose it. Everybody doesn't choose it. You can believe in the promises that I have made to you, God says, or you can choose not to. The choice is really yours. God is basically telling us that he's done it all. 
it, it was all him. It wasn't much. Of, we had very little to do with it. All we had to do was receive the free gift. He did it all. All the work of bringing creation and himself back together. He did all that. Listen, God knew that he could not woo us back. He knew that he could not woo us back because he couldn't woo back all the people in the Old Testament. He tried for hundreds, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years. He tried in the Old Testament to woo them back. He tried all of that, but he knew that he could not do it. But he figured out another way. He knew that he could do it through the life and the death and the resurrection of his son. He knew that he could bring Jesus into the picture. And he knew that he could bring us back by punishing Jesus for our sins. For your sins and for my sins. I was talking to somebody in Home Depot yesterday. I went to Home Depot twice yesterday and I could not get out of that place at all. It's like I, I ran into everybody, I mean three people that I knew. And one of, the, one of the people that I knew earlier in the morning, I was talking with them and they were talking about how unfair life is. And honestly, I couldn't help but think about somebody that I knew who actually was a good friend of mine who passed away on Saturday. And all I can think about, well, this, this person is talking about a hangnail that he has. I'm thinking about the fact that I know somebody who has just lost a husband today. And you want to talk about unfair. That seems unfair. But you want to talk about unfair. How about this? God sending his only begotten son to die in your place and my place. I wouldn't do it. I'll be honest, I, I love you guys, I, I, I think the world of you, but if you ask me to give up my son for you, I'm sorry, but I couldn't do that. I just couldn't do it. He knew that he could do it through Jesus, that he could bring us back into a relationship with him. Uh, an unknown author wrote... Um, Longfellow could take a sheet of paper, write a poem on it, and make it worth $60,000. That is talent. Rockefeller could sign a piece of paper and make it worth millions. That is capital. A mechanic can take material worth $5 and make it into an article worth $50. That is skill. A merchant can buy an article for $1, put it on his shelves, and sell it for $2. That is business. But God can take a worthless, sinful, sinful life, wash it, and cleanse it, and put his Holy Spirit in it, and make it a blessing to all humanity. That is salvation. Amen? Amen. And that salvation is available for all who choose to accept it. God's voice comes to us in the maze of life, and it calls to us. He calls to us to come to him. He calls to us to come to him. And he calls to us to believe in his promises for our lives. And he calls to us to believe that he has given us salvation. And he calls to us to be in a right relationship with him again. And he calls to us, all of his people, to worship and to praise him as our Lord and Savior. He calls us into grace. He calls us into love. He calls us to be his. A closing poem says it well. It's titled, God Does. It says, when you feel unlovable, unworthy, and unclean, when you think that no one can heal you, remember, God can. When you think that you are unforgivable for your guilt and your shame, remember, God can. When you think that all is hidden and no one can see within, remember that God can. When you have reached the bottom and you think that no one can hear you, remember that God can. And when you think that no one can love the real person deep inside of you, remember that God does. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word today and for its truth. The truth is, Lord, you have been wooing us since the time we were born. In so many different ways, you have been doing just that and you basically said this, I want to have a relationship with you. I want to have a relationship with you so much so that I would send my only begotten son to die in your place so that I might have a relationship with you. That's the price that was paid for that relationship. 
how can we not accept it? In your precious name we pray, amen. Our closing hymn.